Hey, good evening, everybody. Welcome once again to Edge of Reality TV. I'm Willie Hassel, and this, of course, is the lovely Lynn Nickerson. Good evening. Good evening. And also Lynn. the mystical, mm -hmm. the mysterious Lynn Nickerson. Yep, just about as mysterious as you are. Mysterious as yeah, I you are. Have you sure? I don't know. It might be a might be kind of a toss up. You think? <laughs> yeah. Tit for tat. Yep. Yeah, maybe, maybe. So, uh, are you hiding any uh, possible secrets of past lives? Maybe. Or? A couple. Yeah. Yeah, a couple. we've discussed that. I was going to bring up yours tonight too. Oh, you were. Yeah, I was. Mine? Yeah. Okay. Because tonight's uh, show just happens to be on the subject of reincarnation. I didn't know that. So, no, I'm telling them. Oh, I you see. You see the people behind uh -huh, the camera yeah, there. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, I know, you know. Uh, it's a subject we haven't uh, discussed before on the TV show. We did it on the radio show, but uh, yeah. we haven't done it here. No, right. And so, our guest tonight happens to have had a past life. Yeah, he believes that uh, in his past life, he was Matthew Whittier, brother to John Greenleaf Whittier, the uh, writer and poet from here at Havel. And after many years of uh, research and investigation, he believes he does have proof that he was Matthew Whittier in a past life. So let's welcome to the show Stephen Sacalarius. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you very much. Have you on? So what I was going to mention is, you know, reincarnation isn't exactly accepted by everybody. It's sort mm -hmm. of a uh, an offbeat paranormal thing and there's nothing really typical about the paranormal but that is a little bit more offbeat and I wanted to say that yeah I first told you when I met you that you were a Viking and then you had another psychic confirm it Norm Moody as a matter of fact yeah. do you remember that yeah there's been a couple yeah I've said that and, and a sea captain but I don't remember them you know yeah. I don't remember those I bet under hypnosis you might I have to try it someday so anyway, then another thing I wanted to bring up is my mother was a real skeptic about reincarnation. And she was um, engrossed in the uh, Taylor Caldwell books. And Taylor Caldwell used to write about people from ancient times, like 2,000 years ago, around Christ's time or, or a little bit before. And she started researching on Taylor Caldwell. And Taylor Caldwell had gone under hypnosis with the purpose of trying to discredit the possibility of reincarnation. And she wound up becoming a believer mm. because she started reliving some of her past lives. So I thought that was pretty cool because my mother wound up doing a, a complete flip of 180 degrees and she became a, a believer. So uh, the other thing is too, we did a radio show on um, reincarnation and it was um, the most, well, the, the strongest Robert. one that I remember was Robert, Robert L. Snow. Snow. Yeah. And he wrote, let me see, Portrait of a Past Life Skeptic. He had been a police officer, and he started getting inclinations of a past life. So through dreams and hypnosis, and he did a lot of research, he came to the conclusion that he had been a painter in the 19th century. So he was concerned about writing about that because he was a police officer and he didn't know how it would affect his career. And bottom line, it kind of did, but he felt that in order to be honest, and to bring up all this, and he had all the evidence, he had a lot of evidence, um, that he would write the book, and it, it was very popular. So, we'd like you to kind of take us from the beginning of your journey on how you discovered this, and I know that <clears throat> it wasn't Matthew Whittier that contacted you, but rather someone else by the name of Ab Abby Poyan, and you were aware of her, but she had been trying to contact you psychically with no success. You just weren't picking up on her vibes. So you want to take it from there, Stephen, how she got through to you and your um, episode with the, with the medium who had been contacted by Abby as well? well of course, I, I, I learned of Matthew before then and studied a little bit about his history. Mm. And that's how I learned about Abby, because there's just a little bit about Matthew Franklin Whittier's first marriage in the yeah. Whittier biographies. Uh, so I was aware of her and I was aware of their relationship, but like I said, there's so little about them, about her in particular. So at one point I wanted to have two past life regressions mm -hmm. and I didn't have any budget, but I had a friend who was a therapist and she said, well, I can do that. And she was going to do a self-help CD for the Monroe Institute actually, and I had a Mac and it had GarageBand software, and I was good enough that I could create kind of, you know, good enough that I could create backgrounds, you know, for that kind of 
speaking over. So the trade out was that I would do the background and she would do two hypnotic regression sessions. So we started from there and I had certain memories about that. But uh, while I was doing the background music, I felt inspired to create one little tune. I was making a sampler for, the, for my friend. Yeah. You know, and one of them was totally, different. most of them were space music, basically, you know. Uh, electronic music, and one of them was totally different. Uh, to my ear, I've never had a French person listen to it, but to my ear, it's kind of a lilting, sad little French tune that I would never normally create. Well, the therapist, when she listened to the sample, she didn't like any of them except that one. She says, mm -hmm. I want that one. I want you to do this. I want you to slow it down. I want you to simplify it. And I got very defensive. And I said, you can't use that one. That's a message from my soulmate in the astral realm. And without any forethought, I don't have any idea why I said that, and I didn't know why I felt from. so strongly about it. Mm -hmm. You know, and I got to thinking about it, and I said, well, I think this is, you know, a message from Abby. And I'm not... You thought you channeled that music then, right? I think from, she... Yeah. yeah, and she okay. was a musician, it turned out. I didn't know that at the oh, time, but she okay. was a musician. So um, then there were some other things, and I can't remember the exact order of these things, because I had a visitation dream with her, and then I found her portrait. I think that those things came later. But I said, well, I've had these psychic readings. I'd used a psychic in my reincarnation research before then and also personally. Uh, a woman named Candace Zellner who worked out of the Phoenix and Dragon bookstore, if that's okay to say that. I don't know if she still does anymore. This was in Atlanta. And so I wrote her and I said, uh, would you be willing to do you know, a reading to try to get me in touch with my past life? I don't think I, I, don't think I said anything at this point because I didn't want to tell her anything you know, to prejudice it. And she wrote back and says, no, I won't do it because you have an attached spirit and looking at you psychically is like looking at a funhouse mirror, all distorted. Really? She wrote me. And I was taken aback, you know, oh my gosh. So I said, well, maybe it's just she doesn't understand what she's seeing. So I, I wrote back and I said, well, I'm studying a past life. So the past and the present are kind of getting mixed up. And I, I'm trying to contact my past life wife. And I think she's trying to, wants to contact me. So she wrote back and she says, oh, okay. Now I see what it is, and that's okay. Mm. So she agreed to do the reading. So uh, this was March uh, 10, 2010, and it was scheduled for 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And she called me. She says, I almost called you an hour early because I've been bumped. For the last hour, I've been bombarded with images. That's how eager Abby was to talk to me. Wow. Mm -hmm. So then I took notes. It wasn't recorded, but I took real-time notes. And she made a whole bunch of hits, but I didn't know they were hits because that came later after I got deeply into the historical record. But and she did was, she have a, a name? Did she know who she was talking no, to? No, she Not had no idea. Okay. Yeah, what she knew is I wanted to contact my past life wife. I sent her a picture of Matthew uh, without any identifying information. Mm. And I sent her the second page of a letter that Abby would written, but she said she didn't get it. The file was too big or something. She oh. wasn't very good with computers. So all she had was this picture with it. And I think she, I, she might have known that it was a 19th century, I think. And that's all she knew. And she was right down the line. She made a couple mistakes, but out of, you know, maybe 12 statements, 10 of them were right on the wow. money. You know, including that Abby died of tuberculosis. And, and she, kept, she kept insisting, how, what about the five children? And I said, well, they only had two. And then she'd come back and say, uh, you know, what about the five children? And then I realized, oh, he had three by the second marriage. That's why she's saying five. So she was right and I was wrong. <laughs> you know? wow. Yeah, there was a whole bunch more that I can't bring to mind right yeah. now, but she really nailed it. But she also brought Abby through and told me a lot about her and I got a sense of her personality and so on. Did she, she, she also said you were both ahead of your time, which is really cool. Oh, she yeah. said really smart and ahead of your time. And I had another psychic reading later where he kept, four times he kept talking about how intelligent she was. And they didn't know anything about Either of these people yeah. had no idea, you know. Um, did she, at that point, did Abby, through the medium, bring up the fact that you had been her former husband? I think it was, Im I think it was implied, you know. Okay. Now, now, the psychic said, I forget exactly how she put it, it says, you, you, know, I, you know, I believe that you were Matthew. It says, no, it's definite, you were Matthew. So given that she had been married to Matthew, then it was pretty obvious you know, that yeah, I would have to knew. have been her past mm -hmm. life husband. Could have been her brother or something, but I didn't know if she made it clear to you who you were to yeah. her. Yeah, and I, I don't think she needed to, <laughs> honestly. Wow. That, so that got you going. So why did you decide to pursue it? Pursue? 
pursue her or the research? <laughs> well, the research on Matthew because they're two separate things. Yeah, the research on Matthew I'd already I'd already started before oh. then because I had found him just by accident online. I I had had a psychic reading with another psychic years ago, and she had told me you were a writer, a female writer on the West Coast, uh, mm. probably around 1930s. And, uh, and you wrote serials and had some success with it. So I would kind of get online and look for the names of female writers. And I found one that I don't think I'd ever heard of unless, excuse me, unless I studied her in school or something. You know, but I, I got online and, and it was Sarah Orrin Jewett, which oh, people sure. here probably are familiar with in, yeah. my, in uh, you know, Atlanta. Nobody's ever heard of her, basically. And didn't you say California? Didn't the medium Right, so it's a totally the wrong oh, okay. coast and everything, yeah. wrong era, because this is like the late 1800s. Right. But I got on that website and I said, boy, this looks familiar. There's something feels very familiar about this and I don't know why. So I kind of sat on it for about a month and then I wrote to a friend of mine who was in my documentary named Jeff Keen, who I knew was had a, an ability to create synchronicities. I don't know how he does it, but there were two or three that happened in my presence with him that were really astounding. So mm -hmm. I said, well, maybe he can help me. So I sent him the link. And a half hour later, he says back, comes back and he says, I felt guided right to it. I went to this interior page on the Sarah Orange Text Project website. And that page is not there now. But, uh, and here it is. This looks like you. He was a humorist. I'm betting this was you. And, and Ma Matthew came up and it's 90% similar visage, you know, his face looks very similar to mine. So Matthew was just aware of who Sarah Orange was. She, and he she was at his funeral and they apparently knew each other. Oh, okay. So she, there's no she implication was being, that you had been Sarah. No, no, right? I never okay. felt that. Yeah, oh. I never felt that. She was one of the young women that John Greenleaf Whittier mentored, but apparently she also knew Matthew there in Boston because she was at his funeral. Oh, okay. So there's that much of a connection, and it was yeah. enough of a connection to where they put him on the website along with her other social Well, that's a pretty good find. Well, I looked at that, and I looked at the eyes. I didn't even notice how much he looked like me at first. You know, I just looked at the eyes, and I said, I'm looking at myself. That's me. That's how it all started. And we've got a picture of that, too. We're going yeah. to put it up. Um, so getting along, you know, both of them were writers, Matthew and Abby. And at the time, and we're talking mid to late 1800s, there was a lot of plagiarism going on, right? Yeah, this is more like the first half of the 19th century, but yeah, a lot. When they were writing, though, wasn't it toward yeah. the mid? It was, well, Abby died in 1841. So okay. she was writing so, from 1830 to 1841, right? She so was, during that time in the 1800s, there was plagiarism. A lot, yeah, a lot. Yeah. It wasn't normal. There's writers that say, oh, it was accepted. It wasn't accepted, it was just, Huge, you know. Yeah, well, there were no copyright laws then either. Right, there were so, not really effective ones, yeah. So people could borrow something and maybe refashion it a little bit and then put it out as their own. And I imagine there was a lot of that. There was a, there was a lot of different kinds. There's, the, the, what happened with Matthew is that he was so kind-hearted, he would mentor people. He would go in and as a younger poet or younger writer, and he would share his unpublished stuff with them oh. to teach them, and they would publish it. See? Oh, he'd give them copies. Type he'd give thing? them copies of his unpublished work, and then they would they would uh, <clears throat> betray him. Basically, that happened over and over. Hmm. Abby was plagiarized by her classroom teacher, Albert Pike, whom some people know who Albert Pike was. He taught a class in 1830 in Newburyport, and she huh. apparently, from all the circumstantial evidence, she was one of his students. And they had the same initials, AP. So he would publish her work. And I'm sure what he thought was, if I get caught, I'll say, oh, I was just publishing them for her. And if he didn't get caught, he would claim them. Well, he never got caught. And so he claimed all that material and it made him famous for a while as a poet. So they might have been disgraced socially or something if they did get caught. I mean, there was some sort of retribution, right? Well, yeah, or I mean. they always turn a blind eye? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that it was just so common. There was another kind where people would go through old newspapers and oh. literally lift something that was really old and submit it, but the, but the editors would catch it because they were very sharp, these editors, and they had a mind like a steel trap. And mm. I, I've seen several examples where the editor would write in the two correspondence column that they had to you know, say, well, I accept it or I reject it or you know, talk to the readers. And they'd say, that's a very nice poem, but it was actually published 10 years ago. <laughs> you know, So that was that going on too. But the really smart plagiarists were the ones that, that 
that stole unpublished work from unknowns. Yeah. Because that they could, they were defenseless. They couldn't yeah. do anything yet. Hard to disprove that. Um, well, then, since since we're on that, um, you are under the well impression, or you have strong feelings that a Christmas Carol had been written by someone other than Charles Dickens. Right. So I wanted to touch on that a little bit. Um, you believe that it was jointly written by Abby and Matthew? Right. Okay, so in your research, what were the, what were the elements that led you to believe that? Briefly, <laughs> because yeah, briefly. this is a huge, I've got a huge paper on this and then there's way more, so I have to pare it way down. I had a feeling when I was writing my blog, my public blog in 2006, a year after I first discovered Matthew, I suddenly had the feeling way down into the blog, I have a feeling that Matthew had something to do with the writing of this story. And I didn't know what it was. I was guessing maybe he wrote Dickens a letter. You know, I wasn't being too grandiose. Mm -hmm. I just said, I have a feeling he had something to do with it. And I noted it in my blog. And that blog is public record because archive.org's Wayback Machine captured that. Yeah. And you can find it still online. So that's dated and recorded. So I had that feeling, but I had nothing to go on because I had never mm -hmm. studied anything about the origin of a Christmas Carol. Do you so, consider yourself psychic? No. No? <laughs> Not particularly. Well, I think you probably have a lot of intuitions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, you know, I don't know. I, I don't consider myself psychic. I'm able to sort of catch Abby's thoughts at this point after 12 years mm. of, of being with her, but, you know, I don't get anybody else. Of course, I don't want anybody else, so I don't know if I opened myself up to others. I don't know. But anyway, so three years later, I started really researching it in earnest, and I really was concerned that I'd get into it and I'd find that there was it was totally impossible. The dates were completely off, and you know, I was prepared for it to be impossible, just like Captain Snow and other people that, that yeah. are trying to disprove. Yeah. You know, I was kind of like that. And the more I dug, the more it fit. Everything clicked, including the fact that there's proof that Matthew had written Dickens a letter. And then there's so we had yeah, ah. and then there's then there's proof that Matthew was or evidence that Matthew was personal friends with Oliver Wendell Holmes, oh. who was instrumental in bringing Dickens over to Boston in 1842. Oh. See, so he would so there was a welcome dinner, and Holmes was involved in preparing that welcome dinner and bringing Charles Dickens over, and Matthew and and Oliver Wendell Holmes were personal friends. He definitely would have gotten a personal introduction, no question. You mm -hmm. know, so we've got that. You know, there's all of these elements, and they kept falling into place. And had it been published, A Christmas Carol, yeah. by Abby and... No, um, no. No, it had... Now, okay. the psychic Candace Zellner said there was a copy, but it was destroyed in a fire. Signed copy, she okay. said. And then I found out that Matthew had, in fact, had a fire in 1852, but we don't okay. know if that was in it. So how do you suppose Dickens came across a copy of it? Matthew handed it to him. Oh, he did? See, this is the year after Abby died. And Matthew wow. apparently went through a phase of writing a whole bunch of tributes to her and of, he had been very interested in Stoic philosophy. So he wanted to kind of disperse all of the things that reminded him of her and start over, I guess. And so he did two things. He started giving things away. And we have a little bit of evidence of that he asked John Greenleaf Whittier to go to the rocks, is what they called Rocks Village, and oh, take yeah. this package to the rocks, and you know, what, in Haverhill or, yeah, in Haverhill. which would be Abby's effects, you know. So yep. we, I know he was giving her stuff away, and to uh, contact prominent literary figures and give them samples of his work. Now, now what I feel is that Matthew and Abby wrote a Christmas Carol with the idea of transforming the world. The mm -hmm. idea was that it would take each individual reader through a process of spiritual conversion. And Abby, of course, was a musician. She, and calling the chapter staves was, had a double meaning. And the first meaning was musical, and she was a musical prodigy. Yeah. But the other one is staves can be a rung on a ladder. Yeah. So each chapter was a rung on a ladder towards the spiritual conversion that everybody was gonna have vicariously as they identified with Ebenezer Scrooge. It was a deeply spiritual book. It was never a ghost story, okay? So, mm. uh, you know, I don't know if I answered your question, but that's, that's what they had in mind. They would have started it in 1838, not long after their son Joseph, who was 11 months old, died of scarlet fever. Mm. So the Tiny Tim character is at least partly representative of their son Joseph. Okay. 
How is it then that they arrived at the title of Christmas Carol? Because she was, well, for two reasons, because, sorry to interrupt you, because she was a musician and because they based it on a story called The New Year's Bells. The New Year's Bell? Ma Bells. Matthew had written a story, I think it was in 1832 roughly, because that's what matches his style from about 1832, kind of science fiction-ish, yeah. but it has a whole bunch of the basic elements of a Christmas carol. And when I say that, I don't mean, I don't mean it lightly. I mean the, the last paragraph is, it has some of the same wording as the next to the last paragraph in a Christmas carol, and there are elements just like it, you know? So they would have started with that as a template now, unfortunately, that one got plagiarized and was published in 1852. So, you know, I have to prove that it was plagiarized in order yeah. to prove that Matthew wrote it. And then I have to prove that it came before a Christmas Carol because that was his style around the early 1830s. So it was a little wiggle room in there. But as far as the story itself, it's, it's obviously got, it's obviously a precursor to a Christmas Carol. There's no question about it. So they would have started on that soon after their son died in 1838 based on that earlier story, which was called The New Year's Bell, so it already had like a musical yeah, theme. Yeah, connotation to it. Um, did you say their son died at eight months old? It's Eleven months, yeah. Eleven the months. The second child died at eight months. Oh. But their first child, Joseph, died at eleven months from a scarlet fever. bear. But then, tragically, because they were being persecuted in Amesbury. They were living in Amesbury. They had eloped to Dover, New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. They were persecuted there for their abolitionism. And then they moved to Amesbury and they were persecuted there. They were publishing a little newspaper. Matthew was very strong against slavery, published one of John Green mm. Whittier's anti-slavery poems on the front mm -hmm. page. There's, a, there's two, two photographs of the front page that's left. And, uh, and also Abby was being persecuted as a witch because she was interested she in the is. occult see? and she was psychic, I think. So yeah. they were being double persecuted. And there's yeah. a little mention in that newspaper that girls were throwing rocks at the windows and one of the Southern editors that commented on it blamed him and assumed that they must be throwing rocks through the windows, which I think is what they were doing. They were stoning the house and screaming at her. And she's in and Matthew's at the printers, the newspaper, and these girls are th throwing rocks through the windows and screaming horrible epithets, probably, and she's terrified that they're gonna burn the place down. Yeah. So this is the kind of persecution they were up against. So what happened was that he went to Michigan because John Greenleaf Whittier, his brother, Quickly, he arranged for Matthew to try to move to Michigan and, and talk to this abolitionist in Michigan, Thomas Chandler. And when Matthew came back, his son had died in the interim. Mm. That's really sad. Um, at what point, because I know you told me this at some time, that they were living in Dover, New Hampshire? Right, for about a year and a half they were in Dover, yeah. And where was that in their, in their, their path of different well, they places eloped. that they lived. They eloped to, to where, where was it they were married then when they eloped? Well, listen, we don't know. We know they were married by a congregationist, congregationalist minister, oh. Cushing, James Cushing, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Whether it was at the church, the uh, East Parish Church, or whether it was on the road. Here's what I think happened. Do you think it was in Dover? No, I don't okay. think so. I think it was on the way. Okay. Here's what I think happened. They ghost wrote a sermon for David Root, who was an abolitionist minister in Dover. Mm -hmm. And he gave that sermon in Haverhill in the evening on August 2nd, 1836. Okay? And uh, later on, John Greenleaf Wheeler asked that it be republished, so we know he was aware of it. But I, I'm by style, because I've compared David Root's actual style, which is very stuffy, with the style of the sermon. That's Matthew and, and Abby, see? So they ghost wrote the sermon, he gave it in Haverhill. They had an excuse to be out in the evening with horse and buggy. Mm -hmm. And after the sermon, they took off for Dover. <laughs> That's what I think happened, you know. Oh, you think they were married in Haverhill? I think they, who knows? Mm -hmm. I don't know if they were married over the state line, whether there was something about getting over the state line mm -hmm. or whether they were married there in Haverhill on their way out. No, I don't know. Well, didn't you say in walking the streets of Dover that you, I don't know if you had any flashback that you had some, yeah, some intuitions that they had walked the same streets? Yeah, I had, uh, oh, I had a pl flashback. I didn't know where it belonged to, and that's of them holding hands after they were married and walking down a, a street, and it's in the evening, and it's, uh, um, it's autumn, and the leaves are 
off the trees, mm. branches are bare, the, the hearth fires are glowing, and they're talking very high philosophy, and it's a very, very high feeling, you know, that they, and I think for Abby, it was like she'd been told that, oh, he'll treat you like a dog after you're married, and it terrified her, and, and what she was feeling then was, oh, it's exactly the same as it's always been between us, you know, mm -hmm. it was a huge relief. With him, it was, they were flying in high philosophy, you know, well, that stuck in my mind. And when I looked at the streets of Dover, I said, oh, I think I recognize Silver Street and Locust Street. It was near the yeah. first parish church. It was right in there somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well about two minutes. To yeah, the okay. Um, well, I wanted to kind of finish up the Christmas Carol then, because um, there was another publication called The Unbidden Guest that was published by Matthew in 1836 in England. Oh, right. Yeah. And that was sort of a precursor publication to something else that Dickens had written. Dickens wrote um, the one about the goblins, Goblins Who Stole the Sexton. Right. The story was kind of based on Matthew's story, right? Well, I think it was. Nobody okay. else would think that, so. That was yeah. the implication the, I the, thought. Uh, the, the story of the goblins who stole a sexton is always given as the proof that Dickens wrote a Christmas carol because it's considered a precursor. Yeah. But in my opinion, he based it on something that Matthew had published eight months earlier, The Unbidden Guest. I just found this, you know, like a week That's ago. That's amazing. Yeah, and it's me, very close. The plot it's very there. good indication that some of these notables were borrowing other people's work. I think a lot of them were. But what I think of mm. it is like like a pop star today, they don't write all of their own material. No, they don't. They wind up buying it from somebody. They buy it or they, at least you they know, buy a few it. of them maybe borrow it, you know, a lot of them yeah. buy it upright, you know, out or front. Or redo it and give them credit. Yeah, but it's not their song. You look into yeah. it a little bit like I thought Country Roads was John Denver's song. No, it's it's uh, Bill Danoff and, and Taffy Nevert, I think it was, that wrote that really? song. Yeah, know? and he made it popular. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, well, we're just about at the bottom of the aisle, yeah. so it's probably a good place to uh, stop for a couple minutes. Maybe we come back, we can talk a little bit um, more about the flashbacks and your life together with Abby. Okay, okay back in a minute. So we'll, be, we'll be right back. Yeah, welcome back to the show. Tonight's guest, Stephen, Stephen Sacalarius. You had it right. And welcome back, Stephen. we're talking about reincarnation and his past life as Matthew Whittier. Yes, we are. It's, so, it's wonderful when hosts get my name right. Yeah, it's very yeah. rare. I studied. <laughs> I studied. <laughs> kind of reconfirming, huh? Mm. Your importance I can't the spell it, but I can say it. <laughs> as long as you can spell it. There you go. Really I had nice. to spell it in first grade, so. <laughs> um, so uh, we were talking about A Christmas Carol, and I think that we'd, there's still something else here to wrap up. So. What I was asking you was if you could cite briefly an example or so that would indicate that you felt it had been borrowed from Matthew, probably without his permission is the idea. So you were going to read us something. Yeah, yeah, there's a, there's a couple that. smoking guns that I found by okay. go, carefully going through the manuscript. And you can find, it's the Morgan Library and Museum in New York. And you can get on their website and you can find a zoomable copy of Dickens' original manuscript in oh. his hand. And it's called Morgan's? And Morgan Library. Okay. Yeah, and Museum. So you can get on their website, you can find this thing and, and, and zoom in yourself. And you'll, what you'll find is that there's a lot of changes and whenever he made a change, he put a heavy corkscrew motion so you can't see what was there. So you've, it's also got notes and whatnot? Right, notes and everybody. But I mean, it's like, it's not so much notes, it's revisions. So I don't think that was the first draft. See, I think that was like the second draft, yeah. or third draft or whatever. But my reasoning was there's got to be more of Matthew and Abby's original writing underneath there. So I started mm -hmm. looking to see where can I see underneath this corkscrew scribbling, this redaction, see? And there's a, there was one place in particular that struck me, and I've got this in my notes. I'll have to go by my notes. But this is in toward the end, and I think Dickens was hurrying toward the end because he was trying to get it out in time for Christmas. So we're getting into the third spirit, the spirit of the future, Christmas future, mm -hmm. the scary one. And there's a speech given by that ghost. And this is typical from Abby's prose. If you get into her stories, you'll find that she talks like this. Um, 
But if you look at it the way he printed it, he's talking about a man who has died and he was a good man and he was a giving soul and so on, a giving person. And he says his, well, I'll read it, his, let's see, it is not that the hand is heavy and will fall down when released. It is not that the heart and pulse are still, this is when the man dies, but that the hand was open, generous and true, the heart brave, warm and tender, and the pulse a man's. Strike, shadow, strike, and see his good deeds springing from the wound, and he ends it to sow the world with life immortal. Now that was Abby's prose, more or less, but the ending he's changed. The ending used to have something like the soul set free immortal. That was Abby's words. Now that is Eastern mysticism, what they call mukti or liberation, the soul set free, mm -hmm. immortal. See, well, that's mysticism. What Dickens did, he erased that and he put something that sounds vaguely Christian and wouldn't offend anybody and sow the, the world with life immortal. Well, if you get into theology, the only one who can sow the seeds of life immortal is Jesus. An ordinary good guy through good works doesn't do that. Matter of fact, in Christianity, you can't get yeah. you can't get heaven. A lot of people don't think you can get heaven just by good works. So this is somebody that dies, that's done good works, and, so, and according to Dickens, he's sowing the world with life immortal. Only Christ can do that. So he's, he doesn't. Dickens has no idea what he's talking what, about yeah. spiritually. See? Yeah. He just tacks something on. Well, here's the point of that: the real author was deeply studied in mysticism. The real author would never have dumbed it down. Hmm. You know, couldn't have mm -hmm. because of the integrity of what they believed in. Therefore, somebody else, by definition, logically, had to have dumbed that down. Couldn't have been the original author. Okay, so that's the first smoking gun. Okay. Now, this ghost takes Ebenezer Scrooge back to Bob Cratchit's house, and we all assume that Tiny Tim has died. And he is hanging out at the grave, Bob Cratchit. And there's a reference to the last few days, which means that this has been going on for at least three, because two is a couple, three is a few. So it's been at least three days. And he gets home, but then there's something very strange that happens. So Bob Cratchit comes home and he breaks down, my little, little child, my little child. Now I'm gonna read just a little bit here. He broke down all at once. He couldn't help it. If he could have helped it, he and his child would have been further apart perhaps than they were. He left the room and went upstairs into the room above, which was lighted cheerfully and hung with Christmas. There was a chair set close beside the child, and it's lowercase, and there were signs of someone having been there lately. Poor Bob sat down in it, and when he had thought a little and composed himself, he kissed the little face. He was reconciled to what had happened and went down again quite happy. Now, what, what child is this? Tiny we thought Tim? that, we thought that uh, Tiny Tim was in the grave. He's been hanging out at this grave for at least three days. If Tiny Tim isn't in it, why is he hanging out at the grave and holding back on going home and supporting his family? On the other hand, if this is Tiny Tim lying in state for three days upstairs in a room cheerfully lighted for Christmas, then it's awfully trite to say that he thought a little bit, kissed the little face, and was fine. That's hugely trite. Yeah. But it hit me all of a sudden. This is not Tiny Tim. This is the Christ child in a creche. This is the family shrine for Christmas. This is a creche, and Abby was raised Catholic. The, Bob has gone upstairs to pray to the baby Jesus in the creche. That Ex makes sense Except to that me. Dickens yeah. here has put it in lowercase and yeah. hasn't said who it is. Otherwise, he could have been referring to a little ghost child that he saw, but that wasn't the point. That yeah. didn't fit. Well, no. No, 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 you know, there's, there's no, he would have had to say that. Mm. You know? yep. so, so if you look at the, at the draft, it's the, the, it's the C on child is kind of halfway capital. It's a little mm -hmm. higher, it might be a capital, it might not be here, it's definitely lowercase. If he took what was intended to be a Catholic reference to praying to the baby Jesus in the creche, and he dumbed that down, but he was in such a hurry, he didn't make it clear what the heck he was talking about. It's a clear mm -hmm. smoking gun that somebody has secularized somebody else's work, and that the original author was probably Catholic. <laughs> Yeah, I have to agree with okay. you on that when you yeah. compare the two of them like that. Yeah.
And then you've got, you got both of these smoking guns in there, see, yeah. all in the same section. And this is the section that Dickens was rushing through so he could get the book out. Okay, so you say, you, you do believe that it was co-written by Abby and Matthew. Do you think Matthew like did a storyline, then Abby flowered it up? They started from New Year's Bells. And you'd, from, ha you, oh. you'd have to read that story to see how close it is. I mean, it's extremely close. Mm -hmm. And so they started from that, but there's a whole bunch of stories that Abby wrote that are deeply spiritual, that you can see her influence. Her, basically all the real metaphysics and all the real paranormal elements, and here's the paranormal elements that are real. Dickens didn't know anything about this stuff, but there's karma, I bear the chains, wear the chains I forged in life, that's karma. Yeah. He has astral travel, when you touch my robe and you'll be uplifted, that's a, that's a raise and vibration that allows someone yeah. to levitate. There's, there's astral travel, there's uh, uh, Marley's ghost is an earthbound spirit, and he talks about what it's like to be an earthbound spirit, having these terribly intense regrets that you can't do anything about. All this is authentic occult studies mm. that, Matt, that Abby had been doing for years since she, before she was 14, right? And I mean, there's other things in there I forget now, but that's enough. You get an idea that yeah. this is authentic and Dickens' others are not, they're just fanciful. Right? Yeah, yeah, that, that's really pretty clear. Um, how about then, I didn't want to leave the dream visitation just as we left it. Do you have any clear recollection of what that dream visitation was about? Yes, but I was not apparently allowed to remember the conversation. Oh, darn. All I remember is the end. So we're in the hall, like a Holland Tunnel. We're in a car, I'm driving, she's passenger. We're in something like the Holland Tunnel, which is probably the tunnel between you know realms. Right. But I translated it in my mind as driving in the Holland Tunnel. Okay. And we had this long conversation. She was very clear in my mind. I remember what she looked like. Beautiful, of course. and. We had this conversation, which I don't remember, but then at the end, I started to get kind of lucid. I started to wake up mm. and I said, you know, you're not a real girl, you're in my imagination, because I was starting to be kind of, and she was amused. She said, oh, is that so? And then, then I woke up, <laughs> and you see? Woke up. But I had such a clear vision of her, what she looked like, that mm -hmm. I immediately hopped on Google and I selected images and I downloaded 12, one was a duplicate, so 13 images of young women that looked like what I remembered in my dream in one way or another. And that was two weeks before I found her actual historical portrait. And when I found it, it's very similar to those. It's wow. right on the money. <laughs> and I had no possible way of knowing that. Well, that's kind of heartwarming. Yeah, it was wonderful. Find that. <laughs> and that's the only one I've ever had with her. Yeah, I do believe in really strong psychic dreams and I think that was one of them first of all you always remember it I mean there are sometimes things that you don't remember it's almost like it's being kept from you mm -hmm. but you still have the, the vivid recollection of seeing I her. can see it now yeah I can yeah. see her now it was very vivid okay well speaking along the lines of the paranormal what were some of the other flashbacks that you had I know that you went and visited um, the Whittier birthplace right and what happened to you there well, first of all, I have to say that early in my study, I would get photographs of it. And it's all painted and it's fixed up and everything's very mm. nice. And I didn't have any sense of recognition for it at all. From the outside. From the outside, yep. with pictures. Um, and that used to bother me. I thought, well, how could I be this guy if I can't even remember <laughs> the place he grew up? You know, it was really kind of disturbed because I, was, I wasn't sure. And yeah. I would say, this is kind of a, uh, you know, in the negative column, you know. And then I finally found a picture, it's a postcard, and it says the Whittier, the Whittier homestead as it, uh, as it looked when John Greenleaf Whittier lived there. And I think it was actually a little seedier than when he lived there, because it was like many years later, yeah. so I think it's not quite fair. Yeah. But, but that looked pretty familiar. I said, it's not painted mm. especially. You know, I said, oh, okay, it looks a little bit, well, because that, that was built in like, I think, the 1600s. If I'm not mistaken, and it they get really run down, back. and they weren't that good about you know painting and keeping the house up and making it look good. Well, we know from Snowbound there was like holes in the in the yeah, walls. Exactly, and, stuff, but... and that's kind of typical. Yeah. But anyway, so 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 anyway, so I said, okay, well that's interesting. So then I drove by, and I saw there was just a couple things that looked familiar on the outside, and they're totally generic. The first is there's a big standing stone where you'd get off the horse at the, right at the front, and it had a vein of quartz in it. Hmm. And I had the feeling that, I mean, I've always been fascinated by quartz and granite, you know, but I said, I think that he was fascinated by that. And then down at the creek, 
because apparently they play down there. There's a little rock that juts out. You look over the road and not very far from the road, there's a little rock. And I said, oh, he used to squat on that and, and sail leaf boats. <laughs> well, totally generic, you know. I mean, it's I can't amazing, prove anything though. with that. I mean, I, I, I think it probably was genuine, but, but then I arranged for a tour and I got inside. And the minute I got inside, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I bet it did. Because, because they have made efforts to bring when, when they reacquired the house, they brought as much of the original stuff back and made it as authentic nice. as they could. And, but I was in a position where it was just me and the caretaker, and we had a wonderful conversation for about three hours, wonderful guy, but I was not able to let my feelings out. See, I had to sit yeah. on them. And after about 10 minutes, it kind of faded and it was gone, you know. But if I had been allowed to, you know, to really... I bet you could have recollected them. a lot. Well, I would have had a lot of feelings. Mm -hmm. Emotions come through much more readily than mm -hmm. cognitive memories. That's usually what things are associated with you, to um, to verify that they're true and authentic is if there's an emotional the emotion, connection. Emotion, yeah, has yep, to be that there. Pulls it. Now, there was one memory I got from looking at a photograph. Yeah, I was hoping you were going to mention that. And, if you didn't, and I would. it was... I had the same strong feeling when I was in the house. As you walk in, I think it's the front door, not like the mudroom in the kitchen on the side, but the front door, there's a stairs off to the right. And there's three steps and a landing. And I said, oh, I used to take a running start, put my hand on that post, swing up and land on that landing, three steps up with my boots and a whomp. When you were a kid. When I was a kid. Obviously, I was old, but, but see, apparently, I just ran into something recently that shows that he gained his height very early. He was 6'2". John Green and Whittier was also tall. Wow. Both brothers were tall. And he must have attained his full height quite early, like 12 or 13 or 14. Sometimes that happens. So at 12, he would have been able physically, because it's not really that big. All these things are a lot smaller in real life than what you think they're going to be. So when I looked at it, he could easily have done that, you know. But I just yeah. read him. He was very mischievous, you know, and, and energetic and got in a lot of trouble. So it was, I think he would have gotten in trouble for that, you know. And we actually do have a, a photograph of that. Yeah, that, yeah, good. Yeah. And I hope we have a photograph of the following. Was George Bradburn's picture there? Yeah, George Bradburn was uh, actually Matthew praised him to the Boston Chronotype editor, Elijah Wright, whom he was friends with. That's a radical anti-slavery newspaper in Boston. And Matthew praised him to the editor and said, uh, you ought to pay attention to this guy because he gives a wonderful speeches and so on. Well, he became like an associate editor toward mm -hmm. the end of the paper's life in 1849. And I was looking up the chronotype because I knew Matthew had written for the chronotype. And I was looking it up and I saw this thumbnail picture of George Bradburn. And all it said was that he, when I opened it up, all it said was that he had been an editor for the chronotype in around 1849. But it's a profile. And I looked at that and all of a sudden it came alive. Oh, the, oh, it was in the on the internet. It was on the internet. Thumbnail on the internet. Yeah, and I, I enlarged it, and I oh. looked at it, and it came alive. And he turned to me, and a big smile broke out in his face. And I felt a, that he was a very close friend. And the, the thought came to me, he was like a warm hearth on a cold day. Wow. I've never heard that expression. Nobody says they've ever heard of it, but that was the expression that I remembered. And he was a very close friend. So now I have to say that many years earlier, I found that the researcher I was working with had told me about him, and she had mentioned that there was a memorial about him, mm -hmm. you know, written. And I completely, I didn't pay much attention to it at the time. I said, oh, I wasn't him. I didn't really get what she was trying to say, and I forgot about it, but technically I had seen that. So I found the memorial, not remembering that I had ever seen anything about it, and I read it, and at first it says that he was good friends with John Greenleaf Whittier, and I was disappointed. I said, well, <laughs> that's, not, that's not what I remember. What I remember is they were really tight. And then at the end, it says he worked at the Boston Custom House in the Naval Department for 14 years. Well, so did Matthew. So they were co-workers oh. in this little group of men for 14 years, and they had all these things in common. They were both spiritualists. And here's something that in the memorial, his wife Frances said, she asked him, are you afraid to die toward the end of his life? And he said, no more than I would be to walk into that room, he says. Hmm. You know, so, I mean, they, they were, these are powerful guys. You know, in that memorial, they probably made the association with John Greenleaf because he was the more popular one and right. people could identify with that rather than saying Matthew. Yeah, Matthew's nowhere to be seen in any of these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he's sort of secondary. He's kind of overshadowed by he's his He's always, brother. he's not even named. He's called the, the brother of the poet. Mm -hmm. I have a letter by, Bra by of Matthew's from the Boston Custom House and twice is penciled in brother of the poet. It's <laughs> wow. all know, he's ever known as. That, that some people might say, oh, this guy's really flaky because he saw a picture come to life. 
Willie had a very similar experience. Really? Yeah. Looking in the mirror at himself. It, yeah. And just it wasn't a, a picture, it was a reflection in the mirror. He yeah. was doing like yeah. um, scrying mm. kind of mm -hmm. and. And the, the, my reflection in the mirror, to make a long story short, Changed. turned into a young girl who was murdered by uh, a local a butcher's, butcher, mm -hmm. yeah. butcher's son. Wow. But anyways, what happened was the picture, the reflection in the mirror, while I was just motionless staring right at the mirror, the reflection turned and there was other people next to me watching. It turned and looked at the other people. Well, I'm, getting, I'm getting chills right And, and the mouth started moving. Wow. And she started awesome. talking. Wow. That's pretty mm. freaky. Those things yeah. do happen. Yeah, they do happen. Yeah. It was the only time that happened to me. It wasn't like yep. I had this, you know, next week and the week I, you know, but only I think time that ever happened. That's a great paranormal story. It just yeah. that adds more impact as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, well, it's, it's pretty evidential because I didn't have any way of knowing that they were that close. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah, that's a really great find. Yeah. So yeah, we definitely have to include that picture yeah. of Mr. Yeah. Bradburn. Yeah. Very cool. Um, okay, how about regarding paranormal stuff, other flashbacks. Now, there was something that happened in the town square of Portland that gave you an indication that you vaguely remember having been with Abby. Do you recall that one? Yeah, that happened under hypnosis, and it's just I don't. There oh. wasn't really anything that triggered it. I don't. I don't even like. I've got the transcript. I've got the recording of it, and I don't see anything that brought it on. You know, but all of a sudden, I saw myself. And I can still see this. I'm in a big open area, and uh, there's men, no women or children that I can remember, just men in black coats and top hats, and they're milling around in this big open area. It's at the far end, there's a man standing on a farm wagon with a megaphone speaking hmm. trumpet, giving a speech, but nobody's really paying much attention to him. And I have a thought and a feeling, and my, my thought is there's something big going down in a distant place, and we're okay now where we are, but it's gonna mean big changes. And then mm. the feeling was cynical. It was like, oh, well, we'll see about that. That's not the exact wording, but it was like that. Yeah. So to make a long story shorter, or short, <laughs> as short as I can, I, I found in the his, history that this was what was called the Great Union Meeting in Portland um, on uh, January, let's see, January 26th, 1861. So it was preceding the Civil War. The South had declared that they were going to secede. There was a citywide meeting. All the voters in Portland, which is men, mm -hmm. were called to the city hall, which only held 2,500 people. So it was it, it, the accounts say it was filled to overflowing, so much so because there was way more than 2,500 men that could vote in that city. So there's, I forget what the total population was, 30,000 or some 26,000, 30,000 or more. But anyway, they would have spilled out into these town squares. Sure. Stump speeches, it was, it was typical to give stump speeches and I did recognize two of the buildings that were in the background at that time in a photograph. Okay. So I knew where it was, which was Congress Square. Now it's called Congress Square Park. And, uh, and everything matched. All the details matched. And he would have been cynical because he was, along with William Lloyd Garrison, who he was affiliated with, was a disunionist. The disunionists did not, they had, they had a motto, no union with slaveholders. They wanted the South to leave. Mm. But the people that were conducting the meeting were the conservatives who said, uh, oh, we'll do anything to placate the South to keep them from leaving. We'll change the laws. You know, we, they won't leave because we'll give in on all these things. Matthew would have been cynical. He would have said, oh, well, we'll see. And it yeah. definitely was something going on in a distant place. See, I thought it was maybe the Emancipation Proclamation. I had no idea. That was like too late. I had no idea what it was. But that was my feeling, you know, well, there's something going going down. Yeah. And, it, and it's going to change everything, but it's not, we're not in any immediate danger here. See, it was perfect on every point. That was quite a hallmark, really, and I can see why that spontaneously surfaced. That's the strong, was well, a, it was a hallmark, yeah. yeah but that really was the was. strongest, the most strongly verified memory, I think, in the whole study. There was, a, there was wow. really only a handful that were, that, that were strong like that. That's amazing that it matched, uh, what, Congress Square, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah cause, but, but here's the thing, I feel like if I get four, three or four or five, then it's a real case. Oh, and yeah. And all the other, you know, it's like that, that solved that problem. Yeah. It is a real case. But, and even if, even if the other 60 are, are just plausible, you know. 
I think that's really good evidence in the research that you're doing in that kind of research. Because I had no possible way of knowing that. See, yeah. I, I, I'd never heard about the great union meeting. That I mean, Matthew wrote about a great union mm. meeting, but I had no idea what that meant. You know, I didn't know what that was. And it's kind of ironic that you're living in that town right now. Well, it's not ironic. I purposely oh, oh, went up there really? to finish okay, my was research. Deliberate? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And another flashback. How much? Are we, how are we doing on time here? Five more minutes. Okay, good. Um, we went went out to visiting a couple of cemeteries, and we visited Abby's headstone as well as Matthew's. But at Abby's graveyard, um, you had recollections of her funeral service there, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You want to tell us about that a little bit? Yeah, I, my, I was working with a researcher, a volunteer, a first year, 2009, 2010. And she asked me, do you remember anything about Abby's funeral? And I said, no, I don't remember a thing. And then things started to come to me, and I started writing it. Well, I don't have that email. I lost that one. I, I still have the ones that are like a day or two after where I'm referring yeah. to it, you know, but I can't find that one. But I know what I said. I remember the whole thing. So I started writing her about, and I still remember it. We arrived in carriages, horses and carriages. We wow. parked on a road, a sandy road, like it was kind of orange-white sand, and there was a bank. And we parked, and we walked down about 200 feet on a, on a slow incline down on rough terrain. It was, the, it was like grass and stubble and almost like it had been plowed, you know, but it was like stubbly. And we walked down about 200 feet and we got to this area that where her grave was and the background, it was kind of enclosed in like a semicircle of shrubbery. And there was a little fruit tree, like apple tree or some kind of fruit tree on the left. And we stood in a semicircle facing the shrubbery, all men, and the ceremony was there. And a wind came and blew the blossoms down on the grave. Mm, from the and tree. I struggled and struggled. I, I'm speaking in first person now because I remember it. Was that a sign or was it not a sign? Was it a sign or was it not a sign? Because there were little stars and she was big into stars. So they were like little star-shaped flowers and they all went right smack on her grave. I remember that. And I thought, that's, at first I said it's a sign. Then I started doubting. And then I went back and forth and back and forth. See? So that was the ceremony part, and I've shown you guys where I think it was. Yeah. Later, my researcher found the grave. It's right up at the front mm -hmm. on uh, Broadway, but it was moved there because it was a burial ground before. And a burial ground, the family would just pick any spot that they liked. But when it became a cemetery, they moved it. Well, I couldn't find that record for Greenwood Cemetery, but Pentucket Cemetery here in Haverhill, there is a record that they did that in 1845 when it was a, a lot and they made it into a cemetery, they moved, uh, the source here says, uh, to it, many of the dead from the old cemetery were removed. So so what, what is the difference, legally speaking, between a burial ground and the cemetery? Was the cemetery part of the town then? I don't know exactly Maybe what the legality is. It's, I mean, a cemetery is an official organization. I don't know yeah. who owns it. Uh, the Greenwood Cemetery is privately owned. Yeah. Um, but uh, a burial ground is just a place that's been set aside that m maybe somebody just picked out once and other yeah. people said, that's nice and we'll go there. And they would pick out a place that would be nice to visit. It's under a tree or on a hill or overlooking the Merrimack River or whatever it was, you know. Yep, or and, it might be somebody's a plot of farmland that someone donated. Exactly, and said, but it'd be very yeah. inefficient, right? They're yeah. just all over the place. So when they, when they incorporate a cemetery, they want everything, you know, really efficient yeah. and tight, so they move them. Yeah. So that's why it didn't matter that the grave wasn't where I expected it to yeah, be. Yeah, that makes a whole lot of sense. Yeah. And um, the flashback then, or what you've kind of, it was sort of a premonition almost, at the Peasley Garrison House after the service, there was sort of like a, a get together. Well, my, my researcher extrapolated, she lived pretty near the area. So she went there and she, you know, found out about the Peasley Garrison House and she kind of extrapolated that would be the logical place for them to have had the memorial oh, service. Okay. And in fact, it was in uh, Abby's family on her mother's side. So oh, that makes okay. it more so And it was what, a mile distance or something? Yeah, really half close. a mile or something. It's just down the road. Okay. And uh, so it's, it's the logical place. Plus it had a room that I remember going in the front and there was a big room to the right as you go in the front door. And there is one there, as I yeah. understand, that they had the meetings in the past and everything, so it's obviously big enough for that, so that fit. What I remember is I'm kind of like this table. There's a coffee table in front of me, and I'm sitting on one of these little sofas, like a two-seater or something, and it's got the hard horsehair, you know, single cushion like they used to have. And in front of me is a, a figurine, bronze figurine, 
about maybe eight, 10 inches high of a dancer pirouetting. And she's under a bell jar. The bell jar does not have a handle on it. It's smooth and it's on a dark, rich wood base. And I, as Matthew, stared and stared and stared at it because mm. the people I had brought, this was a funeral after the funeral. This was one arranged, I think, by her mother, especially for Matthew, because he didn't, he and her father were enemies. He would not have been able to go to the original yeah. one, which was mid-April. So, but he brought these friends that didn't know Abby. So they're all socializing and cutting up and having a good time. Yeah, and, and it was tearing him up inside. That. It was yeah. killing him. So he felt like running out of the room. And if I were to run out of the room, I would go to my left and take a left again out the door. That's where it was. I was facing, you know, if I was facing away from the front of the house toward the back of the house. And I wanted to leave. I wanted to run out. But out of respect for Abby's mother, who had arranged this whole thing, I you wasn't going to do that. So in order to hold my feelings, I'm staring and staring and staring at this thing. Now, the question is, does anybody know where it is? Yeah. That's what I want to That's a big question mark that it could be out there in the, is it, so I, the world I, I contacted, of antiques somewhere in I contacted in antique stores. Nobody's heard of it. But is it in somebody's private collection? And would they be willing to tell me? So, you, know, you never know. It could surface. Someone may, may decide to get rid of it. It you would know, be in even stronger sale. proof than the, than the Great Union meeting if I found it. Because it's yeah, very that would specific. Be yeah. Very cool to find that. Yeah. So it may still be somewhere in Haverhill. If somebody does know the whereabouts it quickly, how could they get a hold of somebody. Well, my website is www.ial.goldthread.com, like a needle and thread, and you can find the way to yep. contact me through that. What's the IAL stand for? In Another Life, that was the documentary on oh, reincarnation. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yep. Right. So if anybody has seen this thing and maybe even owns it, just to uh, contact that would be wonderful. Yeah. Stephen about that. Yeah. That would be great. That would be really good confirmation of, more confirmation of what you feel to be true. Yeah. And that's it. We well, all right. We managed to get in pretty much what we wanted to, didn't we? I think so. So thank you very much, Stephen. Oh, thank you. Fascinating thank you story, on. really. And, Tale, uh, I should say. So that's Edge of Reality TV. And next month, we have psychic Christopher Brown. Yes, we do. coming down. Yes, he's, he's quite uh, the medium. He's a psychic medium. He does some great uh, gallery reading. Terrific. He's, uh, he's pretty amazing. So yep. he's going to be He brings us. people in tears all the time. It's going to be joining us next month, so yep. be sure and tune in. Yep. And Hope to see you then. then. Good night, good day, goodbye. And so long. Until next month. <laughs> <laughs> Until next month. Thanks for joining us.